we all know and love the real numbers. In case you don't, it's recommended that you watch the number sets video first, which is basically a prequel to this video. Anyway, infinity is not a real number, in the mathematical sense of the term, at least. But, since this is math, we can make up new systems of rules if we want. In math, a rule that's true because we say so is called an axiom. So, let's attach two endpoints to the real number line, positive and negative infinity. When we extend the real number line like this, what we get is the extended real number line. This is denoted by double struck R, the symbol for the set of real numbers with a line over it. Now, we aren't quite done making up rules yet, because we need to decide what we can actually do with positive and negative infinity. Based on our current knowledge of numbers, let's think about how we might want our new number system to work. Firstly, we know that a very big number plus a very big number is also a very big number. For example, 1 million plus 2 million equals 3 million. You can think about infinity as the biggest number there is. So if you add it to itself, that will also give you the biggest number there is, which is infinity again. So infinity plus infinity equals infinity. This may seem really silly and not very mathematical, but math and silliness are not mutually exclusive. In any case, if you do want to motivate this definition more rigorously, then it's certainly possible. For example, infinity may be considered as the limit of a function whose value grows without bound. From there, the sum of two such functions can be shown to also grow without bound, yielding another infinite limit. But for now, we'll try not to get bogged down in details, instead thinking about the rules intuitively. Now, a small number plus a big number is a big number. But every real number is small compared to infinity. So for every real number a, we can say that a plus infinity equals infinity. But what if we add positive infinity and negative infinity together? If we add a very positive number and a very negative number, the result could be all sorts of things. A very positive number, a very negative number, zero, and so on. If you've taken calculus, you may recognize infinity minus infinity as an indeterminate form of a limit which similarly means that we can't find a specific value without further information. Although it may seem reasonable to assume that positive infinity and negative infinity are both the same distance from zero and would therefore cancel out, we don't do that here. So infinity minus infinity is undefined. That's the basics of addition and subtraction. A full list of rules for extending the four basic arithmetic operations is as shown. Generally, these rules can be understood using intuition, in a similar manner as before. Unfortunately, no, you still can't divide by zero in this system. There is a system called the projectively extended real numbers that allows division by zero, but we won't cover that today. Now, you'll recall from the previous video that we were able to place number systems, consisting of sets along with operations on them, in categories like ring, semi-ring, and field. These are types of algebraic structures. So, how can we categorize the extended real numbers together with addition and multiplication? It turns out that you can't get very far. Addition and multiplication aren't even binary operations in this system, since they aren't defined for all possible pairs of numbers. So our categorization system from before won't work here. Despite this, the extended real numbers can still prove to be useful. As previously mentioned, they can be used for limits, as doing arithmetic with infinity can help simplify the process of figuring out what value a function is approaching. Limits are essential in calculus, and the extended real number system gives us a handy shortcut for calculating some of them. Speaking of number systems involving some idea of infinity that can be useful in calculus, the hyperreal numbers are another example. In the case of the hyperreal numbers, in addition to infinity, we also have the inverse concept, infinitesimals, quantities considered to be infinitely small. 
Before we go constructing the hyperreal number system, let's figure out what we want to do with it. For the inventors of the system, the goal was to create a system that transferred the important rules of the real number system. Fittingly enough, this is called the transfer principle. In particular, we want this system with addition and multiplication to form a field, just like the real numbers. So, with that in mind, let's start by naming two of our new quantities. Omega, an infinite quantity, and Epsilon, an infinitesimal quantity. Now we need some rules to distinguish these from ordinary numbers. The harmonic sequence, which is the sequence of reciprocals of positive integers, 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, and so on, gets arbitrarily close to 0. So we can define an infinitesimal as a number whose distance from 0, or absolute value, is less than every element of the harmonic sequence. On the other hand, an infinite number is a number whose absolute value is greater than every positive integer. Now, note that the reciprocal of a really big number is a really small number, and vice versa. This behavior motivates us to state that omega and epsilon are reciprocals of each other. That is, 1 over omega equals epsilon, and 1 over epsilon equals omega. We can also use these two quantities in multiplication and addition. For example, you can have 7 plus epsilon, or 5 omega. These are examples of hyperreal numbers. In this system, different sizes of infinities and infinitesimals can exist. Finally, let's introduce a special function, the standard part function, written as st. In simple terms, this function rounds a finite hyperreal number to the nearest real number. For example, consider the hyperreal number 12 plus 5 epsilon. Due to the 5 epsilon term, this hyperreal number is an infinitesimal distance from the number 12. Applying the standard part function, we get st of 12 plus 5 epsilon equals 12. When applying this function to an infinite hyperreal number, we bring back the extended real numbers. An infinite hyperreal number has standard part positive or negative infinity, depending on sign. For example, negative 3 omega plus 9 minus 4 epsilon is dominated by a negative infinite term, so the standard part is negative infinity. The hyperreals can be used in calculus to obtain derivatives and integrals. This is called non-standard analysis, as opposed to the usual limit-based approach. No pun intended. In non-standard analysis, the definition of the derivative is as shown, with the limit definition to compare. dx represents an infinitesimal, thought of as an infinitesimal difference in x. Let's apply both to a simple example, the squaring function f of x equals x squared. In summary, the hyperreals provide a useful alternative basis for calculus, if you really need one. Let's think about a different type of extension now. Not filling in the infinite endpoints on a number line, but rather increasing the dimension of our number system. We already know about the complex numbers, a system that extends the real numbers. Whereas the real numbers live on a one-dimensional line, the complex numbers live on a two-dimensional plane. To be more precise about what we're talking about, let's think about how many real number components each type of number has. A real number obviously has one real number component, and a complex number has two, being the real and imaginary parts. Can we find a three-component number system, say something like a plus bi plus cj for real a, b, and c? It turns out that this ends up completely breaking things. In particular, just trying to find a value for ij can lead us to the conclusion that i equals 1, so a plus bi plus cj reduces to a plus b plus cj, which is basically just a complex number with extra steps. This was the problem faced by Irish mathematician William Rowan Hamilton, until he realized the solution in 1843 during a walk. Use a fourth component. With that, he carved the equality i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals ijk 
equals negative 1 into the Brougham Bridge, and the quaternions were born. The most notable change when extending the complex number system to the quaternions is the loss of commutativity of multiplication. For example, ij equals k, whereas ji equals negative k. Using our classification system, quaternions form a ring, but not a field. The question is, what can we do with quaternions? Well, they turn out to be quite useful for several practical applications, like modeling rotations in three-dimensional space. Unfortunately, they can often be quite difficult to understand for beginners. We'll very, very quickly summarize a treatment of quaternions using a geometric algebra perspective. Further resources can be found in the description. We have three perpendicular unit base vectors, E1, E2, and E3. By the geometric product, which is associative but not commutative, EM squared equals 1 for all M, and EMEN equals negative EMEN for all M not equals N. Multiplying two different ones gives you a bivector, a plane segment oriented along the first vector you multiplied. Negating a bivector flips its orientation. Bivectors are considered rotation objects. Let i equals e1, e2, j equal e2, e3, and k equal e1, e3. These along with 1 are the basis elements of the quaternions, and you can verify with the geometric product that this definition agrees with the defining equality from before. Euler's formula, e to the power of i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta, tells us how to rotate by angle theta, where e to the power of x is the exponential function. In 2D, for some vector v in the xy plane, v e to the power of i theta rotates counterclockwise by theta, and e to the power of i theta v rotates clockwise. In 3D, rotation with either one alone messes up the upward e3 coordinate. Roughly speaking, the solution is sort of to rotate counterclockwise by theta over 2, and also rotate clockwise by negative theta over 2, giving e to the power of negative i theta over 2, v e to the power of i theta over 2. The bivector i can be replaced by an arbitrary unit bivector to rotate in any plane, working in any dimension. This gives the usual formula for quaternion rotation, and we are done.